Welcome to the Ransomware Interviews. I am so very psyched uh, to be interviewing this next person here on the topic of ransomware. As you know, uh, this month we have the ransomware survey. You'll see it in the notes section of the video. So please, please fill that out. We wanna hear from you. Uh, we'll, we'll gather all the information and, and get back to everyone what people report back to us with. But first, Christopher Burgess, this guy is amazing. Uh, author, speaker on, on security strategy, 30 plus years in the CIA. And when he retired, he got the uh, Career Distinguished Intelligence Medal, which is the highest honor you can get in the CIA. It's awesome. Uh, senior security advisor to, to, to Cisco. And that's where I met him originally when I was at Cisco. Um, has appeared on CNN, BBC, I-24, China News, Bloomberg, CBS, NBC, and ABC providing his commentary and analysis. He's spoken at the, the federal, state, and local level. Uh, he's spoken to Interpol, NATO, USSS, and FBI, among others, in the last 15 years. He's co-authored the book, Secret Stolen Fortunes Lost, Preventing Intellectual Property Theft and Economic Espionage of the 21st Century. He's a founder of securelytravel.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Burgess CT. Uh, very, very prolific writer, very interesting. I always enjoy reading his work. Chris, how you doing? I'm doing well, and I'm uh, pleased to be here, and I hope I measure up to that introduction. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So in talking about ransomware, and you know, most of these gangs, financially motivated, uh, coming from you know, Russian territories and Russian states, stuff like that. Where, where do these gangs come from? Well, the, the, the short answer is uh, they, they come from uh, entities looking to uh, har harvest money. Mm. Uh, so they, they, they are, they're criminals. Uh, they are, uh, by, for the most part, well-educated criminals. Uh, and, uh, and not necessarily formal education, but educated in the technical nuances of exploiting known vulnerabilities that have been highly publicized, uh, that the remedies to close those vulnerabilities have been well publicized. And so with knowing that there's a vulnerability there, that there is a way to fix that vulnerability, and then that time continuum between that zero day and when they close that vulnerability is that delta of opportunity. And these folks know that people don't update for yeah. a variety of reasons, some of them very legitimate, right? That sure. update's gonna take my, op my operations down. I've sure. gotta write a whole new routine, right? Yeah. So you, you can't just automatically do these things, but th these folks are uh, have, have more, uh, a long time ago, uh, you, you mentioned my book, when we wrote that book back in the uh, mid-2000s, uh, it was, you know, the script kiddies were disappearing. But for, for so many businesses, I see them still thinking it's just some guy in the basement right. sitting in Moscow with three of his buddies, and it's not. No. They, 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 are, they are in an in a, uh, op center they, they have all the computing needs they get. Shit, they get, you know, hundreds of million dollars a year, they scarf. They can afford stuff that I can't, right? Yeah. Uh, they, they, they have the money to hire the best, e even if it's uh, not logical. So where do they come from? The short non-technical answer, because uh, I, as I've told you, Dave, but uh, those who are watching this for the first time need to understand, I am affectionately the internet Luddite even though I was present at the beginning of the internet. Now, not many people can say that, but I was present there. Uh, so I'll go from general to specific. Uh, generally, they're criminals. Specifically, they can come from anywhere in the world. Uh, right now, there's a lot of focus on the groups coming out of China and the groups coming out of Russia. Uh, but I'm gonna tell you, they, they sit here in the United States as well. Why not? We've got some of the best inter infrastructure in the world. It doesn't go down as often. It's yeah. not restrictive. Uh, so yeah, they can come from anywhere. Uh, it's really, yeah, that's pretty much it. One thing is kind of, I kind of find fascinating. I think you're, you're dead on. These are not script case, right? And, and, and what's also kind of amazing, Chris, I always find with you when I talk about these, these guys and, and gals, it is they have a great deal of sophistication, resources, ops, 
programmers, and sometimes they come across phenomenally sophisticated, right? Uh, and other times they, they come across as, as kind of crazy and irrational. So, so for example, uh, the, the biggest one that people know about is, is Evil Corp, right? And, and the two founders of it, a guy named Maxime Yakovets, also known as Aqua, and uh, Penchukov is the other guy's name, he's known as Tank. Uh, Yakovets runs around Moscow, apparently, in one of 20 Ferraris and Lamborghinis, you know, high-end sports cars, and on his license plate in, in Russian, it says thief. Uh, Tank, which is his partner there, uh, Penchukov, is DJ Slava Rich, and could be seen on weekends spinning records. So, so it's, it's kind of frustrating because at some hands, you know, we're being uh, owned by some pretty weird people. You know, it's pretty yeah, you, you'd think instead of a uh, a Ferrari, he he he'd want the uh, latest Shiguli, huh? That's true. Uh, That's true. He might have one. <laughs> he might have one. And, and, and you know, the good thing is that Ferrari probably yeah. won't stop start start in yeah. minus thirty four <laughs> degrees, but the Shiguli will. Uh, so yeah, they, they they flaunt their wealth. They flaunt the 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 fact that you can't touch me. Yeah. Uh, and frankly, uh, people will touch them when there's a will to touch them. That's a good point. And, and there's one more question I have on it before we get into some more of the other, other aspects of this. I know I'm, I spend a lot of time on the character of the, 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 these, uh, these ransomware people. In, in looking at, um, so Zeus, which was you know, the banking malware, which we get on, on, on enterprise and home machines and, and steal banking credentials and steal money that way. Um, uh, a famous FBI agent wrote a, a piece that appeared, I believe it was MIT paper. And in it, it had a lot of their um, instant messaging, which they, they had bugged, right? And what I thought was interesting was in, in Russia, there's this concept of um, uh, the rules of, of thieves uh, called Vori. It, it, Vori actually was, was, a, was a group of thieves. And in some ways it, it, they, they talk in these romanticized tones that they are Vori, that they're actually the, the underworld. Are these people really the, 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 the words of the underworld? Of, of, uh, no. of crime lord. <laughs> uh, they well, they they may talk of honor of thieves and uh, and perhaps they watched uh, too many episodes of Robin Hood. Uh, <laughs> but they, the the reality is is they're uh, while they are effective criminals. Yeah, don't get me wrong, they're effective criminals. Uh, the lords of the underworld are changing the way the world turns in Russia, for example. Mm -hmm. These folks are just throwing money. Gotcha. They're just throwing money there. They they are demonstrating acts of hubris. Uh, projecting that they escape law and order. Yet, right. if you look around the world at the recent arrests of these criminals that have happened in Europe, in Asia, et cetera, they get arrested based on a U.S. warrant. That U.S. warrant allows the host country to arrest them as they transit. Um, and then they sit in the Huskow there until the uh, extradition hearing occurs. And in many cases, but not all, in many cases, the individual then is extradited to the United States. Gotcha. gotcha. Now, what that does to them, they have all the money in the world and they can enjoy it in Russia. Correct. Correct. Which means only Russia. <laughs> and there, 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 there is a famous case, and forgive me for forgetting the name, I should have looked it up before the yeah. interview, uh, where a cyber criminal flew to the Maldives and got off the plane for his vacation. I think it was the Maldives. And before he went through immigration, which is the no man zone, he was arrested by US law enforcement and put on a plane to the US. Worst day in the world for the guy. And he says, yeah. wait a minute, you can't do this. I'm in the Maldives. And the Maldives goes, well, no, not exactly. You know, yeah. Once you go through immigration, you're in, but you haven't entered the country yet. Right, right. And see ya, and away they went. And you go, whoa, right? And so these folks, because of effective law enforcement outside of where they're operating, have really created themselves a gilded cage. They got a lot of money, they can spend it, but it's going to be on videos and what have you from the West. And it isn't, and it's going to be whatever they can afford or, or create inside so that might explain these vanity license plates on uh you know your Euro european sports cars that you know I, I, that really makes sense that really does make sense and there, there was another person i also forget the person's name who was caught in uh, uh south korea he'd gone there for a vacation and then COVID hit 
and he was stuck there. His Russian passport expired. He went to the embassy and the Americans and the South Koreans were looking the entire time. And in the reverse case of the Maldives case, he was leaving South Korea, about to board a plane and the Americans grabbed him, right? Sure. So, so in that situation there, he was, he was getting ready to go back to Russia and he was, he was grabbed by the United States. But I, I think that- so, you know, the, I think it was the Texas Rangers that made it uh, famous that long arm of the law is real. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The FBI took it over later, but yes, he was was the Texas Rangers. It absolutely the Untouchables, Texas. right? The Untouchables. Elliot Nels. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, another, another thing to talk about here is is you know we always in the industry talk about nation state actors, also known as APTs. There's there's a whole bunch these days. It's not just Russia and China and stuff like that. But when we look at APTs, and then what we you normally call criminals or FINs, right? Financially motivated, you now FINs and AT, APTs. But in Russia, it just seems too darn blurry. It seems like they live with impunity within the, in the, in the Russian realm. Uh, they, they have malware that stops at the border because they, they don't infect machines that have Cyrillic keyboards, right? What is the connection? And, and, and I, get this, I get asked this all the time. It, it is, is the Russian government setting policy and saying, go for it? Is it them turning a blind eye and let them do things? What do you think? You might want to go get a cup of coffee. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I got a lot to think about this one. I wrote a book on this one. <laughs> so what you just described is what I call the perfect storm, right? And, and that is you, 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 you have criminal elements. They have a goal. Yeah. Criminal elements have two goals in the cyber world. This, th this is my distillation. People will argue with me, but not for long. They want to monetize, i.e. put money in their pocket, or they want to enhance their capability to monetize. That's it. Yeah. it th those are their two goals. The nation state brings a third goal into their mix, which is, do you wish to continue? Yeah. OK, because the nation state or law enforcement can take them out. Yeah. All right. Their rivals can take them out. But I, I put that under the category of competitors. So you have competitors who are in, engaged in nefarious activities as well. Not all competitors uh, are operate above board. Correct. That, that, that's just the facts of life. You know, the, I, I invite everyone to go read the Department of Justice news feeds. You will read about unscrupulous business person after business person after business person in the United States. Yeah. Right. N yeah. Not necessarily elsewhere where it, it, it's it's less enforced. Right. And then we then we have the the individual. Yeah. So individuals have lots of motivations for breaking trust. So what I, what I say is the perfect storm is when the nation state wants to protect their industrial footprint or a company in their in in their boundary that's providing tax revenue, and they they go to the criminals and say, get this IP or uh, make it difficult for them to continue. The criminals then go and find an insider, and we just saw this recently, albeit uh, uh, Krebs on security wrote about it, I wrote about it, about the Nigerian uh, who uh, went in and uh, sent this email saying, hey, you want to split a ransom? Uh, just put, you know, put, put this ransomware on the inside, not, not coming in from the outside, and if it, and if it works, you know, you're going to get millions of dollars. Um, okay, that's, that might motivate some, but there, there's lots of motivations for folks to make, break trust, including coercion. Sometimes the criminals are really bad criminals. And they come and they make you an offer you can't refuse. And that happens. It doesn't yeah. happen often, but we all know it happens. Hollywood tells us about it all the time. Correct. Right? Correct. But, but those are the outliers. So what you have here is what I call the perfect storm is it's in the nation state's interest to have this company have a bad day. Look at our pipeline, all right? Perfect so example. The pipeline had a ransomware issue. They paid the ransomware, but the East Coast oil, I'm sorry, East Coast gas distribution was screwed up for days. 
Yes. It absolutely had an economical and a mental effect on the country. The message that the president of the United States delivered to Putin, highlighting that they too had gas pipelines. Correct. Was about as subtle as a tank going through a wall because it was delivered <laughs> quietly. It was, it was delivered pointedly and there is history behind it because those who were around in the 80s uh, may recall that for some reason, and I don't know all the details, uh, a gas pipeline in Russia uh, exploded one day yeah. and the postmortem showed that it was using technology that had been stolen by the KGB at that time, this was pre-1990, mm -hmm. for the purposes of enhancing that gas pipeline. And that stolen software didn't operate like the marketed software. So obviously they, they stole a, a, a version of the software that hadn't been you know, gone through quality control mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because there was a malfunction in it and it destroyed their pipeline. And so you know, sometimes thieves get exactly what they deserve. Correct. Other times uh, it doesn't. So when a nation state is involved these days, especially in ransomware, Yeah, if it's, yeah. if it's focused on supply chain, it's most likely going to have a nation state behind it. Yeah. The yeah. reason being supply chain attacks are so time consuming. They require such an investment of resources. The payoff might be large, but the normal criminal needs a quicker cycle than a nation state, which has the patience of Job. Very true. Very true. All right. And, and deep pockets. Okay. And deep pockets. And deeper pockets. Yeah. They have I mean, not unlimited. I, I don't no, know any don't government know. entity that has unlimited pockets. And yes, I did no. work for the CIA for 30 years. But if you saw the budget I worked off of, you would be amazed at how much I accomplished for the price of a dollar. <laughs> I, could, I could see you talking to your boss. Come on. Come on. How can I do that? <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. I can't do it. You're working for the government. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's a question that, that I hadn't thought about it when we talked before this, but I, I, I thought it posed this to you as well, is, is pay versus not pay. And, and this is something that, that I've seen people do long-winded articles saying you never pay, right? But really, it's not really binary, is it? All right. It's never binary. No. Nothing's ever binary. No. But everyone has a choice. Correct. And everyone can take steps today to help influence the choices they have tomorrow. Correct. All right. And so those who say it will never happen to me are going to have choices that, that are going to feel like they're between the rock and the hard spot. Those who take preparations and put into place the means to address their network getting knocked off the air, their data being encrypted, any of these maladies that are well-documented that may occur so that they can say, the hell with you, flip my switch, I go back three days, I lose three days of data, but I'm back up and running in two hours. Bingo. They have different choices available to them. They still may choose to pay the ransom, but what Here's the other side of paying the ransom thing. What if you pay the ransom and then they say, okay, here's 10%. Want right. to pay the ransom again? Okay, here's another 10%. Yeah. All right, or better yet, here's the ransom. And then they come back in six months and do it to you again, right? You, you, you are now a Correct. recurring revenue stream. You know, they Correct. got apps that can track that. Yeah. You know, that recurring revenue stream shows yeah, you yeah. how much you make each month as you pay that $7.95. <laughs> you know, and, and that's basically what it's going to, because as you 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 mentioned, the ransomware criminal elements are going to the affiliate network mode. So right. they're paying commissions just like my website. If you buy a book on Amazon, Amazon will give me 4% of that purchase price because you read about the book that I reviewed. I, I was okay. talking to someone yesterday, and it, beyond even the annuity aspect of 10%, 10%, or you pay the ransom, you get out of jail 
for, for the week, but then they come back. Uh, I even heard a story of, of one particular case where they, they said, here you go, here's the money. And they found out they gave it to the wrong person and the, the decryptor didn't work. So it's yeah. like, you know, you think, you know, it's like, you know, uh, these, these TVs fell off the back of a truck. You remember, up with a bunch of rocks. Criminals, criminals, crime, <laughs> criminals, crime. And so here you have, you did all the work, you yeah. locked this company up, but they don't know it's you. All they know is they're dealing with somebody who wants a, you know, six Bitcoin ransom. And Correct. then I come in and say, I'm sorry, you know, I erred. I only want a three Bitcoin ransom. Here's your decryptor. Thank you all very much. So, right. you know, not only I, I robbed, I robbed from the criminal. So, you know, that, that. Right. The, the know, other, they, they have no morals. No, there's no morals. There's no morals. You're not dealing on the up and up. That's true. But, uh, but in, in honesty, to pay or not to pay, I come down on the side of don't pay. Yeah. That, that's my personal uh, feeling. On the other hand, if you're a hospital and you are locked up and cannot provide patient care, you really don't have a choice. Yeah. Yeah. And I, mean, I think that, that's you, what you do. You can yeah. ship all your patients out and restart, right? Yeah. But yeah. Th th these are hor horrific choices. They're very horrific choices. And, and that's why there's this unwritten rule that these ransomware criminals don't go after the healthcare systems. But I really think that they bit off more they can, than they could chew with the colonial pipeline. I absolutely and, think so. Too. That the entire industry, criminal industry, had an aw shit moment. I, I think because so. Because they said, you know, when we were knocking down police departments, cities, you know, city of Atlanta, police departments here and there, knocking off small companies where the, you know, the the average, uh, we, we hear about the million dollar ransoms, but, you know, the average is less than $200,000 is paid in ransom. It would, nobody was paying attention. Nobody was reporting it. Correct. The colonial pipeline and the existence of CISA opened up a can of whoop ass. It did. No, it really and, did. And that it was intimated, but it was never detailed that they paid the ransom and the government law enforcement entities and this operational cyber entities were on top of it, watching it the whole way through and took it back and took them down. They did. They did. And that's really impressive. And that we, let's, get, let's get back to that for a second, because that's really kind of critical is in that situation. And I remember at the time, the Revil, the RE evil, right, Revil ransomware group who did it kind of disappeared for a little bit. And of course, they're not gone. They're still there, right? Um, but they definitely went offline for a little bit. And from what, reading various articles and different things, it really did look like the Department of Justice with their task force uh, were on top of it. So in cryptocurrency, you have wallets, right? And, and, uh, and the wallets are, you put, it, you put it forward and you pay, right? They were able to grab the money from that first wallet. So the idea is just like a, in, in traditional crime, there's a lot of money laundering. There's, there's you know, bounce from this place to this place to this place to this place before it comes back to you clean, right? You know, you're clean. But the concept here was they were able to, with their task force, grab that cryptocurrency in that first wallet as it was trying to leave the first wallet. So, so the, the key there is they really seem to be on top of it. And also I think what we were talking about earlier about the Russians being told, you know, you have pipelines too. And, you know, we don't know what happened, right? But yours blew up in the 80s. We don't know what happened. You got bad software, shame on you, that you stole, shame on you. I think that really did have uh, an impact, uh, at least short term, because they did disappear for, for about six or eight weeks. Uh, I think possibly we were talking about, you know, different ships in the night who were doing criminal activities. I think someone told them, higher up, stop it. I don't know. Well, the... When you look at Russia, and let's go back to 2016, I'm going to leave your ransomware topic for just a moment and go to election security, okay? Yeah. The Russian entity that was identified by NSA and was being targeted that had been involved in looking at the U.S. election infrastructure, uh, the individuals within that entity were arrested in Russia in January of 2017. Yeah. And they were arrested 
with the belief that they were facilitating US intelligence access to this capability. Right now, the, the reality winner case made this public because she revealed the classified documents that detailed this activity and essentially shut it down. Right. Yeah. So, boom, yeah. gone. Yeah. We're done. Yeah. But interestingly, some of the players, or at least one of the players that were indicted by the Russians for being a cyber criminal, was also was also indicted by the United States for being a cyber criminal. <laughs> I mean, this guy, this guy had nowhere to go. <laughs> and, and, and so when there is a will or a parochial interest, as that example showed, in ransomware, there will be a thumb being put down upon them yeah. if they're if they are resident in Russia. Yeah. And what what I think we're going to start seeing as time progresses now that markers have been put down is what has always existed is the ability to have a bilateral discussion between two two nations on topics of interest and cyber criminality is one of those topics of interest yeah yeah right yeah and either they will cooperate or they won't cooperate but i think it behooves the united states to try because that's a great, that's a great analogy. You take, yeah. you take the moral high ground by sharing your criminal records, meaning we believe it's this entity and this entity is located in uh, Chile of Links. We think it's this entity and this entity is located in St. Petersburg. And this en entity is located in Novgorod. You, you share the information. They, they are, they're then put in the position of do I take action on this or do I ignore it? And either of those choices is going to be uncomfortable for me. Yes. Yes. Because the next time that entity does an action, then it reads differently. Yeah. On, on the recovery because you knew, side. Because you knew, right? You were told right. they, they're here in Nova Scarada oh, or what have you. And yeah. they didn't so, yeah. do anything. So yeah, now yeah. you have the counterattack that goes into Russia against a criminal act, act, actor that was ignored by those who could have done something. Yeah. Think about that. That was what the colonial pipeline uh, episode, I believe, demonstrated to those in the strategic business of cyber criming that, okay. We're going to have to rethink this because right. they've got a lever now on the government. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that is kind of to me that is the that is the unique angle angle you bring to this. That I think is really kind of critical. Is that even in situations where like Russia and the U.S., for example, are competing almost like they were in the Cold War, the concept was during the Cold War there still was a way to say you capture one of my spies, you treat them well because we have your spies. And there's ramifications here, right? There, there's, there's things that happen. I know you have this person. I, you know we have this person. And in this situation here with ransomware, it's the same thing. I told you where the criminals are. If they act again, I know you let it happen, right? And so it, it's kind of bringing kind of an awareness uh, and negotiation, uh, some well, kind of game theory. We expect, expect the Russians to abuse it because uh, <laughs> uh, if you re recall the Boston bombing. Yes. The, uh, the United States was investigating the Sarnoff brothers. Uh, the Russians used that opportunity to uh, float a uh, flyer into uh, the U.S. intelligence community uh, saying they had a volunteer uh, who was a uh, FSB officer, I believe it was FSB officer, who knew something about the Sarnovs that wasn't being shared with the United States. All right, put the United States in a position they absolutely had to go meet with this individual yes. because to do otherwise would be... Uh, it, it, it'd be asinine, right? We right, want every piece right. of information about this terrorist action that occurred in the United States. Well, when they went out to meet it, lo and behold, it was a setup. Uh, the, the FSB arrested a uh, undercover CIA officer in Moscow, uh, and he was PNG three days later. Right. Right. So they abuse that as well. Right. And yeah. The, the, the flip side of the coin is 
the United States intelligence community knew they abused it. So they sent out an officer who had two, two months left on his tour. Uh, he, was, he, he carried 50,000 euros with him. He used a disguise from the 1980s. Uh, he didn't have any new technology on him. He was using a uh, flip phone and a compass. Uh, so they got nothing except every FSB officer saw that the U.S. shows up with 50,000 euros. Right, right. So they're good for their money. Yep. <laughs> so my experience is when shit like that happens, the line gets long of people saying, oh, they're good for their money. So I kind of backfired on them. Right. But my, my point here is, is that even though they say they're going to cooperate and they will, they will always look for an angle to get you. Correct. Correct. It's, it's still, so maybe yeah, that's just the cynical me from having gone toe to toe with them. But at least, but at least there's some kind, at least there's some kind of beginning of a remedy, right? Or, or at least some way to, to mitigate a, a little bit, right? A little bit. So the, the final topic I want to talk about, and again, there's been so many places where this has been utilized outside of cybersecurity, offensive testing, offensive security, right? The idea of it comes from the military. You have red team, blue team, right? Blue team are mm -hmm. friendly forces. The red team are the enemy. Green team is when you're working with an ally. And again, the, the idea in, in cybersecurity of red teaming, blue teaming, purple teaming, where you're working together, seeing where vulnerabilities work, how you can get through in testing. Where do you think this is in, in cybersecurity related to other ones in the past? Well, without naming companies, right. I, I believe there are companies uh, that exist today in the United States that are making a lot of money doing just that. They, they are uh, red teaming uh, infrastructure. Uh, there are other companies that are making a lot of money who are training folks on how to deal with fish. Uh, and then there are companies also making a lot of money who are trying to deal with the topic of social engineering. Right. There are very few companies that are dealing with the psychological motivation of the insider. Interesting. As opposed to just social engineering. Social engineering, from my view, is I fooled you. But maybe I don't have to socially engineer you to get you to, uh, to come to the conclusion that what your company is doing is wrong. And because it's wrong, now you do this. Now, you know, some will say, well, that's a nuance of social engineer. But maybe, maybe not. But all those aspects have to be tested. It's just yeah. not your, it's just not, can I get over the moat? Robin Hood got over the moat every, every, every episode. Robin Hood got over the moat, right? Every single time. The moat was there, but he got over the moat. So the moat's not going to work. But it slows people down. Correct. It just didn't slow Robin Hood down, but it, it slowed Squire John down. He yep. couldn't get over the moat, but Robin Hood was more, uh, had, had more tools in his kit. So that's where this red teaming comes in. This is where the war gaming, if you will, is really important. Uh, but tabletop exercises are good for the brain, but don't do anything for reality. Because unless you have a, an environment that is technologically similar to what you are operating on, you are testing against something that has a bias in it. Yes. That isn't wrapped in the reality of humans. Correct. Who are trying to get their job done and are skating around InfoSec processes and procedures on a regular basis who are walking your IP out the door every time they leave the door. And, and thus, this testing is oftentimes static yes. when the world is dynamic. And, and to, your, to your point, spot on. I mean, in, in what we do at, at Simulate, we deal with must be production, right? You talk about tabletop exercise. We, we would say that's akin to being in a lab. And a lot of, of people who do these kind of testing want to go into a lab. And we're like, no, it has to be a real environment. And it has to be like you talk about Robin Hood going over the moat. He's going to make it over the moat. But are you alerted that he went over the moat? Right. So the, the concept of like you're saying, things will fail. But do you get alerted when things fail? Do you see things in production? And by the way, there's nothing that, that mimics the real world. Right. So even if you sit there in some kind of tabletop exercise 
in a lab, it's not going to emulate the dynamic nature of your real environment. So it has to be done in your real environment. Very, very spot on. And the idea also of dynamic is it can no longer be a point in time. It has to be continuous in some fashion. So I add to that, Dave, that yeah. when you're dealing with the nation state, their surveillance period yeah. can be much more elongated and at a slower roll than the cyber criminals. Correct. And that slower roll is really hard to plan against. True. Because the anomalies are so far apart. Right. It, it, they could take so much time in, in setting things up, right? Uh, well, that kind of thing. People are selling stuff that I'm going to identify it now for you. I'm going to give it to you right now. Look, yeah. I've, I've just done 70,000 items I looked at, and here are the three you need to pay attention to. Yep. And okay, I look at this one and isolated it's nothing, but it doesn't correspond to something that happened two weeks ago. Correct. Because Correct. time's moving on. It's moving so fast. Right. The correlation. You know, I'm, just, yeah. I'm, I'm hypothesizing, you know, uh, your, your product probably does that. But my, my, my point is that if you're a nation state, your time clock might be different than the cyber criminals. Absolutely. And a cyber criminal operating on behalf of the nation state might adjust their methodologies. And now I'm going to give everyone something to scratch their head about because it was your final question. And that is, what if the ransomware is what they want you to see? Oh, oh God. <laughs> That's creepy. Yes, creepy. I'll just leave that there for some food. For <laughs> creepy, very creepy, but it's true. It's very true. <laughs> Look, Chris, thank you so much. This has been so awesome. Uh, this is great. Everyone, please go see uh, Chris Burgess at his, his site, uh, securelytravel.com. Follow him on, on Burgess uh, SCT. And we will see him again, definitely. I will bring it back. This has been wonderful. Chris, thank you so much. Thank you, Dave.